Our, our next speaker is Peter Donnelly. Peter, if you want to speak from here or the podium, either, either way is fine. Um, I would remind you that we've actually asked the speakers to speak for 15 minutes. I think our timer is set for the full 25. So to make up for that, I have little signs that I learned to make for my friends at Oxford. So, <laughs> so there for you, Peter. Peter is the, um, uh, the director of the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics at the University of Oxford. Um, and he'll be speaking on uh, perils and promise of uh, genome sequence analysis. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the gentle reminder about timing, Terry. So Rick and I got a very helpful, having agreed to do this, which uh, I thought at the time was a bit brave and I now think is very brave. Uh, Rick and I got a very helpful email from Terry and Eric uh, a week or so ago, which said, just want to point out three things. Thanks for agreeing to give the talk. First of all, you've only got 15 minutes. Secondly, we're very grateful for the experience you'll bring and the perspective you'll bring, and we're sure you'll have a bunch of interesting things you want to say. And thirdly, would you mind making sure you cover the following seven questions in some depth? <laughs> uh, Rick did a good job of, of uh, covering the seven questions, but I'm going to adopt a slightly different strategy, which is uh, to pick a couple of those uh, and, and focus on them, things that I feel I see a bit more clearly and, and have more of a sense of. Uh, I'm sure many of the other issues, well, they've, almost all of them have already been uh, touched on, and many of the others will come up at various stages during the meeting. So uh, I'll talk about three different things, issues to do with data access, uh, some of the analysis challenges, and uh, things to do with sample sizes and how we should think about scale of the kinds of studies that we might be contemplating. contemplating. Uh, the first one, data access. So Francis has already helpfully pointed out that there was a meeting a couple of weeks ago on exactly uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, we shouldn't revisit all of that, but I do want to uh, make two points because I think there are, there's one that's directly relevant to the kinds of things we're thinking about here and one of them that is relevant to our field moving forward. It's kind of widely accepted now, I think, that if uh, there's large public funding, or in, in some cases in the UK as well, uh, charitable funding for genomic scale projects, then that kind of data should be very widely available, as widely available as possible to uh, bona fide scientists. And uh, that means both the sequence data or the genomic data that's being generated and the phenotype data that's available on those individuals. And we kind of all, I think everyone agrees to that and signs up with it, signs up to it. The fact that there was a meeting a couple of weeks ago, which I wasn't involved in, is a reflection of the fact that we haven't actually got that sussed yet. We aren't doing it as well as we could be. And I think quite a lot of effort is needed. Uh, the relevance for our discussions, I think, as Francis said, is that an absolutely key issue in terms of thinking about doing large-scale sequencing of cohorts is to make sure that the individuals uh, whose DNA we might be sequencing have in place the right kinds of consents to allow data sharing on the scales that will be necessary. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely critical issue uh, in terms of the requirements we should be thinking of for, for prospective samples. The other point I, I want to make, uh, which isn't just in the context of what we're thinking about in this meeting, but more generally, I think we need really firmly to have in our minds that what we would like to do, so I don't know what happened at the meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't had a chance to, to read the recommendations, and maybe this was exactly uh, the kind of thing that was discussed, but I think we want to be working towards a world in which there's uh, a pretty large joined up database in which in the future we and possibly even uh, clinicians or at least those advising them we'll just be able to look up. Here's a particular sequence variant uh, in this gene, in this position. It's this amino acid change or whatever. What do we know about other individuals who have that change and what phenotype information do we have? So we need to aim towards that. And it's not the kind of thing that we'll get to uh, unless we work pretty hard on it. It's, it's, it's exactly the kind of area where I'd urge uh, NHGRI and possibly some of the other institutes to take a really serious lead. We won't get to the position of having this kind of resource in place unless quite a lot of work is done. It's also not very glamorous work, so it's not the kind of thing uh, that, as I said, it's not the kind of thing that will happen by accident. I want to say a little bit about uh, some of the challenges uh, on the analytical side for the scale of project that we're talking about. Some of this touches on things uh, Rick raised. I want to be uh, slightly more cautious, uh, maybe, than, than he was. So in terms of current technologies, methods for calling variants from sequence data, are pretty good now for SNPs. They're not, uh, it's not a done deal, and they're much better than they were a year ago, and they'll keep improving. We're still not very good at calling uh, short insertions and deletions from short read sequence data, and we're not at all good at calling copy number variants from uh, short read sequence data. And there's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done to get us in the position where we're better at all of these things. 
I suspect that over the timescale of the sorts of projects we're talking about, we will have got better of those, if, although each time a new sequencing te technology comes along, we have to reinvent some of these wheels. Uh, Rick talked about this as well. Uh, annotation of variants, so I mean that in two different senses. The first is, is just the kind of naive and obvious thing about whether a variant is non-synonymous or not. We did an experiment uh, recently in Oxford with sequence data we were collecting in a translational project and just applied various of the available annotation packages to it. And the results were a little bit disconcerting. So for example, there were 70,000 variants that were called non-synonymous in one version of the annotation, by one annotation package and synonymous by another. So it's the kind of thing that we, sh that we think should be uh, already sorted, and it isn't. Uh, again, those kinds of issues will improve. The challenge of knowing what the consequences of a particular variant are, loss of functions, relatively easy to detect, but for other variants, knowing what their functional consequences are, that's also a field uh, in which I think that there's a lot of scope for extra work. We need to, if we're thinking about sequencing cohorts, uh, as we should be with rich phenotype data available, we need to be, to work through the problems, and I think there are discussions of this uh, in some of the sessions tomorrow, through work through, to work through the problems and challenges of just linking very large amounts of sequence data with possibly very, very large amounts of phenotype data, imaging and so forth. Uh, those are just non-trivial IT challenges, and we'll talk a bit about them tomorrow. And, and finally, in terms of one of the things we hope to do, which is to understand the relationship between DNA sequence variants and phenotypes, particularly disease phenotypes, we're not very good at the moment, I think, in terms of the maturity and the uh, efficiency of analysis methods for doing that. We're rather spoiled in the days of genome-wide association studies. The obvious thing to do in a genome-wide association study was just to look at each SNP one by one, do the naive thing of testing each single SNP for a difference in frequency between cases and controls. That's what people did in the early association, uh, genome-wide association studies, and it turns out that you get a long way with that strategy. In the case of sequence data, that doesn't work. There won't be individual, well, <coughs> with uh, perhaps a small number of exceptions, there won't be individual sequence variants that we don't yet know about uh, where we can just look at that variant and look for differences, say, between cases and controls or in quantitative phenotypes. So to see signals, we need to amalgamate information uh, within units where the unit might be a gene or it might more amb ambitiously be a pathway. Uh, there are a bunch of methods out there. If you've, uh, if you've looked at the field, there are a bunch of methods out there which aim to do that. So the uh, hope is to somehow combine variants which are maybe rare or maybe have certain uh, predicted function and so on. But again, we need to work harder on that. I think this whole area is one in which uh, if we look at the methods we're using in three or four or five years' time, I'd hope they've moved a long way from where we are now. It's the kind of thing I always say in this kind of context, but if we're thinking of large-scale uh, sequencing projects, more and more, and particularly for sequence data, we need to think about putting aside substantial resources for their analysis. There's huge potential uh, to combine rich uh, genetic variation data, sequence data, ideally whole genome, uh, and rich phenotype data, but there are major challenges in getting as much information as we can out of that. And it's silly just to invest in the generation of the data without giving ourselves the chance to uh, harvest the rewards from it. The last point I, I want to make, uh, when I was thinking about it, I was reminded of, of the apocryphal story that many of you will know from one of the Sherlock Holmes uh, novels when uh, the policeman, who happens to be called Inspector Gregory, I learned when I looked it up on Wikipedia, uh, says to Sherlock Holmes, is there any point to which you wish to draw my attention? And Holmes replied to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And uh, Gregory says, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes, in his characteristically smug way, says, that was the curious incident. So what's the connection here? Uh, it's something, again, that's already been alluded to. And it's the following. We've already done a lot of sequencing. Uh, Francis mentioned uh, 65,000 uh, samples that uh, NIH were involved in funding. Here are some of the big projects, the ESP project, uh, several type 2 diabetes projects, projects I know of in autism and schizophrenia. They're just some of them. Actually, there's quite a lot of data from uh, cancer normal pairs, but I don't know how much effort is being put into just looking at the normals to look for germline uh, susceptibility issues. So we've done a lot of sequencing already. Many of those projects are relatively mature. They've been going for two and a half or three years. None of them has yet finished, but uh, so what have we learned so far? Well, one thing we've learned, there aren't many examples that we know about yet where those studies have led to startling new discoveries. As I said, none of them is yet finished, uh, but there's some information in the fact that I, I'm involved uh, 
centrally in, in one of them and peripherally in one or two others, and I've spoken to people involved in the other projects, most of them would say that uh, QQ plots, so, so genome-wide measures of how much signal there is, look pretty flat. So there's information in that. I'll come back to what it is uh, in a minute. The other thing is that uh, there's been a huge amount of effort into what's called imputation using data we have from a relatively small number of sequences where we know patterns of linkage disequilibrium and using that information to predict what those variants would look like in very large panels with uh, genome-wide association data. So imputation is something that uh, works reasonably well. If we think about uh, variants of frequency 1, 2, 3 percent, uh, we know that we don't impute all of those well, but we impute many of those well, and that work's been done into, into very large uh, cohorts of tens of thousands of, of cases and controls for some diseases. And again, it's been relatively unfruitful uh, to date. So where have we got? Uh, we, we don't know the full picture. Of course we don't. Uh, and in some sense, uh, as Eric uh, Borwinkle said, it's not you know, we don't have to debate the, the pros and cons of this, but things could have been different. There was a hope that there would be so-called Goldilocks mutations, mutations at low frequency, not very rare, but low frequency with large or moderate effect sizes, things like PCSK9. I think there's growing evidence that there at least aren't as many of those as some people might have hoped, particularly from the imputation data. We've imputed these frequency ranges into very large sample sets. Not all of that imputation works well, but some of it works quite well. So if these were relatively common, we'd have, been, we'd have seen more of them than we have. Uh, it, I think it's becoming clear, uh, not uh, surprising in some ways, but, uh, but it's worth stating, we need to look at very large sample sizes. Uh, I think most of the people involved in the sequencing projects to date, if you talk to them, would say we need to look at more samples. And they're already not trivial. Uh, so I think we need to bear that in mind. Large sample sizes and the ability to follow up substantially anything that looks interesting. And uh, I think at the moment we don't yet know how important rare variants will be in, um, and how important their role will be in terms of common disease phenotypes. We, we all see the attraction, as Francis said, of, of uh, finding examples of humans who are homozygous for, not, for loss of function mutations in particular genes. Uh, obviously very attractive to drug companies who are trying to use that uh, to learn about the consequences of particular drugs. Uh, some of those drug companies have looked for those in genes that they're interested in with uh, not great success to date. As Francis said, different populations uh, will be uh, important in different ways for these kinds of questions. Again, a, a kind of sobering thought. It's not my calculation. It was done by someone uh, I trust. Uh, PCSK9, to find PCSK9 in an exome study, if we're insisting on something like uh, genome-wide significance, would require about 30,000 30, samples. So I think we really have to think, if we're doing this at all, uh, about doing it in reasonable sample sizes. Here, uh, I'll finish just with some uh, power calculation slides, uh, or a slide, some uh, calculations that I borrowed from Mark McCarthy. So the somewhat type 2 diabetes uh, focus. So this is uh, three different settings where you're doing either, for reasons that were natural for, for their purposes, 3,800, 9,000, or 12,800 exomes, and then following up with targeted sequencing of those genes in 10,000 cases and 10,000 controls. So not a small experiment. Um, using a particular test, uh, taking through a certain proportion of variants uh, to the uh, follow-up sequencing. So these represent kind of different genes with different sorts of effects to give you a sense of calibration. So NOD2, which is a gene uh, we now know quite a bit about because of its role in, in Crohn's disease. So it's been known for a while. It would sit about here in terms of its effect. So we're probably looking at this range of the spectrum. And again, the message I want to get across is that if, if we're going to do these kinds of studies, based on what we know so far, they jolly well better be large. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for staying so close to time. Very much appreciate it. Comments for Peter? Questions? Peter, you, early on in your talk, you alluded to sort of the creation of a massive database. Can you going to put a little more details on, on what, what that might look like, what that scope might be? Uh, well, here's the kind of dream. We'd like to be in the position, I think we as researchers, and I suspect uh, at some time in the future, uh, possibly those involved in clinical care, would like to be able to, when they have a patient who has a particular mutation in a particular gene, they'd be able like to look up and say, okay, w which other people have been sequenced, have that mutation, and what do we know about their phenotypes? So that's the kind of thing we'd like to uh, 
aim for. It obviously involves, I mean, there are issues of, of taking existing data sets and putting it in a form where you can make those kinds of queries, but actually just bringing together as much of the sequencing uh, as possible for which there's phenotypic information. And, and your, the implication from that um, explanation is that currently existing databases are not properly structured, not properly scaled. I mean, it sounds like there's a deficiency that you would like to see addressed. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, I mean, I'm guessing this is the kind of stuff that was discussed at the other meeting, and I don't uh, know, I hope it was the kind of stuff that was discussed at the other meeting, and I hope there are recommendations in place that uh, aim to deal with it. Uh, you know, we're a long way from that now. Even in the cases of projects uh, where you can get at the data, you kind of get at the data, and that's not as straightforward as it could be, even in settings where one's trying hard, I think, you can get at the data for a study. And so to do that kind of thing of saying, uh, what instances do I know where someone has this mutation or something that I think might be like it in this gene in terms of the phenotype, you currently need to look in a lot of different places. Uh, and each one of those lookups isn't straightforward. Uh, so Maynard and then Thomas. So with respect to rich phenotypic data, you can make the phenotypic data uh, rich by uh, going for breadth, you know, looking at the whole EMR for a uh, patient or everything you can gather about him or her. Uh, or you can go deep in some particular area, which tends to be the focus of most current studies, uh, you know, very careful diagnostic work with respect to some fairly particular phenotype. Uh, choices are going to have to be made between broader phenotypes or deeper phenotypes. Do you have a, have a view about which way we should go? I don't think I have a well-informed uh, view, if uh, should I express a view at all. I, I just say as a practical matter, having argued that we're going to need large cohorts, that's another, you know, the, it tends to be the case that where there's a lot of in-depth, uh, just for cost reasons, a lot of in-depth phenotyping, uh, that's more likely to be in smaller cohorts than very large cohorts, so that will be a practical issue. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I think they're open questions, and I don't think I have strong, a strong sense of what the right approach is about whether to go in a lot of depth or not. I, I mean, one of the lessons I think that's come out of what we've learned so far from genome-wide association studies, you want to speak to that? Uh, there were debates that happened five years ago that said, actually, we shouldn't really be focusing on disease as an endpoint. We should be focusing on this biomarker or that biomarker. So, for example, instead of doing studies of type 2 diabetes, we should be looking at, at fasting glucose levels at, as biomarkers. Uh, and what we now know, not that it's uh, my area, but what I understand we now know is that actually there are some variants which affect type 2 diabetes as an outcome that don't affect fasting glucose levels. There are some that affect uh, type 2 diabetes and affect fasting glucose levels in the direction you'd expect. And there are some which affect fa fasting glucose levels which don't seem to, accept, uh, to affect uh, the disease outcome. So it's certainly less clear than it... Oh, well, I, th I don't think it's obvious that we're better off focusing on intermediate phenotypes. I think the lesson, uh, at least from, from the genetic architecture in terms of common variants, is that uh, that doesn't always pan out the way you'd expect it to. So it's on this point. So surely this depends a bit on what your study design is. So if you're, for instance, interested in a particular phenotype, I mean, I mentioned earlier the idea of something that's protective against Alzheimer's, or for instance, individuals who are morbidly obese but have normal glucose tolerance, you could imagine then that you would have done pretty careful phenotyping about that issue, uh, and then do your exome sequencing and see what you find. But I think a lot of the time it's going to be the other way around, uh, where it's the genotype that drives your interest. And I would bet in very few, if any, instances would you be satisfied with the phenotype information that you had on those individuals who turn up with particularly remarkable genotypes because it's going to point you in a direction based on what's known about that gene or that pathway that you're going to want to go deeper. And, and I guess the correlate to this, and maybe Peter, this sort of a question in terms of your comments about consent. It's probably then not just consent for broad use of the data as was collected, but it's also consent for recontact and the opportunity to do that deeper phenotyping. Otherwise, you're left forever in the dark. Fair? I completely agree. I think, uh, I think the value of samples that uh, you can go back to to do additional phenotyping will be huge. I completely agree with you. Great. Thomas? This is just an orientation in terms of the large existing databases sequence data and uh, phenotypic data, many of the existing studies have limitations in terms of consent. Uh, 
uh, for what kind of studies it can be used for. So I think everybody is in favor of having these large connected databases, but with existing, it's not, it's not always possible. And also, the existing samples are already consented, you know, may, may are frequently not consented for such a broad use. So in a sense, we are, we are talking about prospective studies where we have to, where we have to either reconsent or uh, develop new studies and, and uh, do new sequencing. Also, I'm wondering, and maybe people who are in the ELSI field can comment on this, how easy it would be to actually propose to use existing databases for clinical use, because they're not, you know, these were research studies are not always generated for clinical use. Uh, just a quick comment on the consent issue. Uh, you're absolutely right, and, and there may well be issues in terms of having to reconsent and so on. But, I mean, there are some large collections. I happen to, Rory Collins can speak to it. UK Biobank is one of them which do have very broad consents already in place for large numbers of samples, uh, but it's clearly an issue in terms of, of thinking about choices of cohorts uh, and, and some of the practical challenges. Uh, maybe I could, um, well, was, we ought to move on, but I was gonna take the last question, but I could never do that to my friend Chris, so Chris, go ahead. Just one, that was, that was a great presentation, and um, you talked about we don't know where, what the analysis strategy is. Many of the GWAS studies have, um, have focused on meta-analysis of, of individual cohorts or large cohorts like, like WTCC and, and then combining those, those in kind of a meta-analysis. Do you think that that's the, an approach that is possible with whole genome sequence analysis or that all of the data need to be in one place from the multiple cohorts or multiple samples to conduct these kinds of analyses? Uh, no, I'm sure that's a good idea in t with uh, sequence data as it has been with uh, GWAS data. That we now know that uh, the sequencing, the, the genotyping assays we used in genome-wide association studies are very robust. You can run them almost anywhere. You get the same kinds of answers and so on. And that makes it much easier to combine data. I think uh, with short read sequence data, uh, there are more vagaries and artifacts and also the genome is huge. Uh, so you'd need to be a bit careful, I think, combining data sequenced uh, with different technologies at different places, but it's not impossible. Uh, so, Peter, I, I assume that uh, these figures are based on unrelated cases and controls. The, the yes, yes. So, how, just approximately, how, how do you think this might be affected if one were using multiplex families rather than unrelated cases and controls? Uh, good question. I don't, I can't do power calculations in my head, and I haven't done it before, so I don't know the answer. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um.